I'm only hoping that the dream doesn't become a nightmare after <laughs> I leave. But I also want to assure you that we too are praying for evangelism at the Super Bowl. And all of our defensive team have got verses in their hands. As soon as they tackle Brady, they'll leave a scripture verse with him before they go. You know? <laughs> You know, the Falcons, I don't know, I think they've been there once, what, some years ago, and that was truly a nightmare. And, uh, but we, we hope, you know, these, this has been a year of unpredictables. Oh, all kinds of things have happened, so it could again. My son is a great Falcons fan. I just stay in touch for academic interest because I meet, meet up with some of these players in my journeys, and so I have to tell them you did a great job. You know, we hope that we can always tell our team that, but it's amazing for a city like Atlanta, we've not done very well with many of our sporting teams. Two hockey teams came and went, and they are elsewhere now. I don't know where they are, but you're all getting one here in Vegas, which is, so maybe we'll come and see a hockey game here. I'm a big hockey fan, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And uh, Derek, really an honor to be here, all joking aside. It's my first visit to the city. And uh, I think we need to be here a little more often. And I will love to come back here. <laughs> Thank you. I told my wife on the phone today, I wish you'd been here. It's been remarkable just to see what life means out here. You know, all kinds of things you witness, and you don't want to see it too often. But at least, <laughs> but at least you know it's a mission field. And uh, we hope to come back. Uh, I also want to thank Kay for being here. Uh, it was wonderful, uh, really good to be with you, Kay. Over the years, we've been together many, many times. One advantage of turning gray is that people think you don't change. You know, it's been like this for years now. So everybody tells me, boy, you look the same. And that's been for about 40 years now, looking the same. But Kay, you look the same too. You look just gorgeous and lovely. Nice to team up with you once more. My two colleagues are here in Sanj and Thomas. They travel with me, and we are going on to Arizona State University. I'll be doing an open forum there. Last time we were there, we had about 7,000 in the audience, and so I expect we'll have several thousand again, and it'll be a long evening. My colleague, Vince Vitale, with whom I've teamed up to write the book, uh, Jesus Among Secular Gods, he will be speaking with me, so we look forward to a wonderful evening. It'll be a tough evening but we'll be there. And also my colleague Bob Grinnell is here. He's uh, on his way back tonight to Atlanta. We have uh, our opening of our new office there tomorrow, and that's why my wife is not with me, as I said. So he'll be heading back, and hopefully, as they have a time of prayer and dedication tomorrow, we won't be there. But uh, it'll be a new beginning for us and planting some new seeds across the world. I want to read for you a passage of scripture and uh, it may be taken the wrong way because of the metaphor. I'm going to talk to you about a builder of walls. But I'm not talking about the walls that you all will be thinking about. Uh, so please shift gears. I'm talking about a civil engineer by the name of Nehemiah, whose city lay in ruins because of his love for his beloved city, Jerusalem, which was destroyed and lying in ruins and he is now in a palace set, palatial setting. And his brother comes to visit with him. And I want us want to read the conversation. And that is this uh, chapter 1 of the book of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, and he goes on to pray in a, a remarkable prayer. You begin in chapter two. In the month of Nisan, that's four months later, four months after this conversation with his brother, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, 
I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. And so <clears throat> I set a time. When you look at all the building of walls that we talk about in our time, very few leaders actually talk about the moral walls that have been broken down, the boundaries that God had set for our existence. We think of every other kind of structure and edifice, and yet the internal rot that has set in and the redefinition of so many things in our cultural existence. The America of today, if you were to compare it to some decades ago, is a dramatically different culture. And in many, many ways, it is reflecting many other parts of the world. <clears throat> it was Malcolm Muggeridge, who was probably one of the leading commentators of the cultural rot in the 1970s, who said this, I had the privilege of being with Muggeridge seven months before he died. It was a dream for me to be with him. I think the most articulate and uh, poignant journal English journalist of the 20th century. It is a toss-up between him and G.K. Chesterton. Muggeridge's books are so remarkable. If you haven't read some of his writings, here was a man who knew how to turn a phrase, and he once said, if he ever stood before God and God would give him a moment or two to ask for forgiveness, one of the things he would ask for forgiveness for was for being so fatally fluent. <clears throat> he was editor of Punch magazine and a great writer. And Muggeridge said a couple of things that were so, I think, prophetic that I want to read at least one of them for you and begin my message by pointing out how fascinating it is what he said 40 or 50 years ago. First, he said this, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. Writing in the 70s, created, you know, boredom out of our own affluence, impotence out of our own erotomania, vulnerability out of our own strength. We blow the trumpet that brings the walls of our own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility and drugged himself into stupefaction. You see, there's nothing so vulgar left in the human experience for which you cannot bring in some Ivy League professor from somewhere to justify it. And writing in the 40s, it was Aldous Huxley, the humanist, who reminded us, we are living today not in the delicious intoxication of the early successes of science, rather in the grisly morning after, where it has become quite apparent that what science may have actually done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. What science may have done is to introduce us to improved means in order to obtain hitherto unimproved or rather deteriorated ends. So when a humanist points it out like that, and when a cultural uh, critic like Muggeridge points it out, and then we read these words from Muggeridge, which I think are so powerful, because writing in that latter part of the 20th century, he was at that time chaplain of Edinburgh University and at the famed St. Giles in Scotland, when he offered in his resignation 
and left the university scene. He left it because of decisions that were being made in higher education that he thought were going to be destructive and decimating, ultimately, of young minds. One of the things they had made decisions at that point was to hand out contraception to university students and so on as a gesture that this is the kind of lifestyle we lead anyway, so we may as well support you in this fashion. And in his last message, out of the famed pulpit, where Knox too had thundered forth, he said this, so dear Edinburgh students, this may well be the last time I address you, and this is what I want to say to you, and I don't really care whether it means anything to you or not, and whether you think there is anything in it or not. I want you to believe that this row I have had with your elected officers has nothing to do with any puritanical attitudes on my part. I have no belief in abstinence for abstinence's own sake. No wish under any circumstances to check any fulfillment of your life and being. But I have to say to you this, that whatever life is or is not about, it is not to be expect, expressed in terms of drug stupefaction and casual sexual relations. However else we may venture into the unknown, it is not, it is not I assure you, on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. However we will venture forth into the future, it is not going to be on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. Fascinating that he, as a journalist, was talking in those terms, and the famed theologian Carl F. Henry, uh, I had the privilege of studying under him in my days at Trinity. He made this comment in one of his books. Biblical truth, transcultural as it is, has an indispensable message for contemporary culture. It addresses modern learning, modern ethics, modern political economic concerns, and all the idolatries of our polytheistic society. It proclaims the gospel to a generation that is intellectually uncapped, morally unzippered, and volitionally uncurbed. Those who consider the latest fads permanently in will, of course, dismiss the Christian message as the last hurrah of an antiquated outlook. They reveal their sickness of soul by derogating terms like morality, piety, family, work, patriotism, born again, and evangelical theology. Christmas, uh, Christianity they dismiss as a kind of middle class hedonism, declaring it to be intellectually inadmissible. They meanwhile espise a life that neither reason nor conscience or spirit can support or condone. Repression of sensuality and of self-gratification they call psychotically abnormal. Subordin of the subordination of the flesh they leave to medieval monks or consigned to the future resurrection resurrection, affirming sexual pleasure to be the supreme good of a life of unending revelry, they waste away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. How much more graphic can intellectual solid thinkers get than that intellectually uncapped and morally unzippered? We are wasting away into ethical ghosts and skeletons. The body which is intended to be the temple of God has now become the, or the object of idolatry in the perverse sense of the term and we measure everything in life by the gratification that this can bring to us and lost our way on the sacredness for which this was intended. Into this arena into this kind of a situation, you and I are called as missionaries to take the message wherever it is that God has placed you and is calling you to minister. I've always uh, and oftentimes told my colleagues as we travel around that this is the most difficult time in 40 years of evangelism that I have sensed in terms of a counterculture, but it is the most opportune moment. No matter where we go, no matter where we go, at university campuses, the audiences are packed to capacity, generally with standing room only crowds. They realize they don't have the answers anymore. They are struggling to find wherein they should turn, in which direction they should move and turn their lives into the hands of what person or what belief or what ideology. 
Chesterton's little statement is so true. The problem with Christianity is not that it has been tried and found wanting, but that it has been found difficult and left untried. If you take the gospel message, it is so unique, so unique, contrast it with any other worldview. No worldview even comes close. Let me take just <coughs> two simple truths from the gospel that stand gigantically over all the others. If you were to talk to a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist, they will all have one thing in common, that the pathway to nirvana or the pathway to moksha, which is release, is through your own effort to build your righteousness up. For the, for the Hindu, it is karma, the karmic law has to work out. If you ask any Muslim, how do you attain paradise? His answer, if he is an honest Muslim and a truthful Muslim, will say to you, your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds, and your deeds will be made on that final judgment day. By goodness, you will have to outweigh all of the badness in your life. And you ask a Christian, how do you know you're going to go to heaven? And the answer is very simple. It is by the grace and the mercy of God not by any righteousness in my life. What a difference, stark difference. And then the centerpiece of the cross in our message. Some years ago, I was talking to, uh, doing a forum with a leading Shiite cleric in Syria, Sheikh Hussein. We had an audience and we agreed to the terms. I would ask him one question, he would answer it, he would ask me one question, I would answer, he's a real gentleman, very courteous, very cordial, and so I agreed to dialogue. And then as he, he would, he, there was an interpreter between us, he would always address me as professor, very respectful, and I would call him Sheikh Hussein. And then finally, as we were coming to an end, he leaned over and said through the interpreter, please tell the professor, I have come to one conclusion after this dialogue, it is about time that we Muslims stop asking if Jesus died on the cross and start asking why. <clears throat> and I said to the Sheikh, do I have your permission to quote you, sir? He said, you do. See, the centerpiece of the gospel and the gift of grace. Now here we go back to 440 or so before Christ. We've got a man who's in a palace, <clears throat> and he meets his brother who comes to visit him. And he asks the brother, how is the city of our fathers? And he says, lying in ruins. The walls are broken, the city is destroyed, and you're gonna be sorry you even asked. Four months later, the king looks at him and says, what are you so upset about? You see, to them, the symbol of Jerusalem's security, that it would be unmauled by enemies, that somehow where the temple of the Lord stood, they would preserve that sacredness Oh, Jerusalem, if I ever should forget thee, let my right hand cunning, you forget its cunning. I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me, says the Lord. It was a symbol to them of the trust that God had given and the protection. But leadership, one after another, particularly three in a row, in a row Solomon, Jeroboam, and Rehoboam, the untamed passions of a gifted man, the wanton power of a weak man, and the unteachable temperament of a privileged man. Untamed passions of a gifted person, wanton power of a weak person, and the unteachable temperament of a privileged person. The leaders led them astray one after another on almost any movement in culture and country. When you see a city in moral decay, Look towards the leadership and see what kind of leadership have we had. What has brought us to this point where we no longer can differentiate between right and wrong. So he sees those walls as a symbol of the ravaging that had taken place and the plundering that had taken place with it gone. How does he deal with it? The first thing is he realizes he has a responsibility. He wants to play a role. He believed he could have a part. And I always think of these words of uh, Richard, in Richard Sumi's book, uh, Nehemiah, God's Builder, and he quotes Richard's, uh, Richard Ellsworth Day in this comment. It would be no surprise 
if a study of secret causes were undertaken, to find that every golden era in human history proceeds from the devotion and righteous passion of some single individual. This not, does not set aside the sovereignty of God. It simply it in, indicates the instrument through which he uniformly works. There are really no bona fide mass movements. It may look that way. At the center of the column, there is always a person who knows his or her God and knows where God is going. At the center of the column is a person. Like Ezekiel, he looked for a person to stand in the gap. Here, he's looking for a builder of walls. And I say to you, the biggest mistake we often make in life in the task to which God has called us is to assume that we really can't do very much. That we can't do it. You know, God has used children. God has used little ones to look into the eyes of the parent and ask a question and turn the life of that parent around. He has used ordinary people. I think it was Charles Wesley who was led to Christ by the maid in the household. This is the great writer of hymns and the great writer of music. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's the way it actually happened with Charles Wesley. What I'm saying to you is don't underestimate what God can do through you. Don't underestimate that. It's not because who you are, but because of how he has wired you and how you are not replicable. What is it Charles Wesley said? God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. That work goes on through you and through me. When Billy Graham was asked by a press reporter, I've heard many preachers better than you, Mr. Graham. Why has God chosen you to be the evangelist to the world? With his shy, retiring smile, Dr. Graham said, when I get to heaven, that is going to be my first question. <laughs> <clears throat> when I get to heaven, that is going to be my first question. Who would have ever thought an ordinary man like that? An ordinary man like that. When he was a younger man preaching, uh, Tory Johnson, one of the founders of Youth for Christ, tells the story that he'd been invited to speak at a high school and he couldn't go, so he called Billy Graham and said, will you go for me? And Billy said, okay. So he phoned the school and said, I can't come, but I'm sending a young evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. They said, we don't know who he is. We don't want him. If you're not coming, we're gonna cancel. And Tory Johnson said, please have him. You will not regret it. They said, no, we don't know him. Tory said, have him. So they had him. And Billy came back and Tori called him and said, how did it go? He said, not very well, Tori. But one person did respond to the gospel message I gave. Said, uh, did you write down his name so you can pray for him? He said, yes. He said, what's his name? His name was Warren Wearsby. <clears throat> can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? An ordinary person who was not known goes and preaches as a replacement, and the hosts are not too delighted about having him. And one man by the name of Warren Wearsby gives his life to the Lord, who later on became the pastor at Moody Church and one of the great expositors in recent memory. Don't underestimate what God can do through you. The last chapter is not written yet. Nehemiah was simply and plainly a civil engineer. That's who he was. But think of where God positioned him. Here he is in an enemy's palace, but he has the most sacred trust of all of them. He would taste the food before the king would eat it. That's the kind of integrity Nehemiah had. That's the kind of trust Nehemiah had. He earned the right of respect. And so the king, when he spoke to him, knew when he asked him a question, he would get a true and an honest answer. There arose a person to help build that wall. You are an individual. That comes from the Latin, which means you are indivisible. You cannot be broken up or fragmented or reconstituted. You are an individual of unique capacity. God can use you, maybe with a statement, maybe with a word, maybe with a gift, and only heaven will reveal ultimately how God has used some of the unsung heroes of our time because they were totally submitted to him. I look at it this way. <clears throat> My dad was a highly educated man. He'd studied at the University of Nottingham in industrial relations, highly placed in the Indian government. 
when ambassadors and when prime ministers and presidents came, when the Queen of England came, he was always in the host committee. I remember as a little boy even meeting many of them. When Khrushchev came and whoever the Crown Prince of Laos, my dad was always at the head of the committee and the uh, president or prime minister assigned him that role. When my dad left India <clears throat> after when we migrated to Canada, uh, the front page story told about his departure from that country. My dad was an impressive man in power. My mother was the real backbone of the family and nobody knew much about her. <clears throat> it was she who was by my bedside when I'd attempted to take my own life. It was she that sat by the bedside of every child, sometimes on the hanging between life and death. It was she who gave me one-liners to help me move into the future. When she knew I was moving into preaching, she said, I have just one word of advice for you. Once you've cut off a person's nose, there's no point giving them a rose to smell. <clears throat> I said, what's that got to do with my calling, Mom? <clears throat> She said, don't be a rude speaker. <clears throat> don't be a rude speaker. If you have cut off a person's nose, he cannot get the aroma of the, of the rose itself. And if today my brothers and sisters were to stand before you, they would tell you she was the backbone of the home in her own simple way. Not very fluent in English, never went overseas to study, but she had that that humility and that dedication of heart. God will use you. He uses a person. But here's the second thing. While he had the pathos for his people in Nehemiah, what did he do? He prioritized his mission by prayer. He prioritized his mission by prayer. 11 times in 13 chapters it says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. I was speaking to 300 French evangelists in Vichy, France last week, and I told them, if you want me to have an idea of uh, your spiritual life, I have only one question for you. Tell me about your prayer life. Tell me about your prayer life, and I will tell you where your spiritual life is and what is the center point of this. You see, in preaching, in writing, and so many public displays, the ego can get in the way. In prayer, you're alone with God. There is no showing off. There is absolutely no room for some extraordinary self-aggrandizing display. You are with your head bowed and your heart humbled before him. If our Lord had to get away from the crowds, to find a place of prayer. If our Lord taught us to pray and to call upon him in the most critical moments of his earthly ministry, he took time away to be alone with his heavenly Father and to seek for wisdom. Prayer does three things in your life, minimally. Three things. Number one, when you pray and begin your prayer with, Heavenly Father or Holy Father or however you do it, that opening phrase recognizes the sovereignty of God. You know immediately as soon as you begin that you cannot ultimately depend upon your strength. The reason you are bowed before him is because he is sovereign over the universe. In my, on my 50th birthday, my wife said to me, what would you like for your birthday? And the truth of the matter is, you know, there's nothing really that most of us need. Everything is sort of like the whipped cream on the strawberry shortcake. You know, you've got the food already. And I said, honey, I really don't need anything. I'm a foodie guy, you know. And so at Christmas, they all give me gift certificates to the restaurants in, uh, in Atlanta. <laughs> And, and, I, and I like it. They all know which restaurants I go to. <laughs> but for my 50th birthday, she said, no, tell me what you want. I said, I'll tell you what I want, but don't break your back over finding it. I said, I regret the wasted years when my family used to attend an Anglican church, and all I did was mock the preacher and mock the service. When I would see people kneeling at their pews, 
I just think, what ignoramuses. They really think somebody's up there listening to them. I said, I miss those days of kneeling before God in prayer. I wished I had done better than that. I said, I would love to have an Anglican prayer bench. If you can find me one from somewhere, I'll put it in my study. My wife's a sleuth. She does, she knows where to find these things. And she got this antique, had to be some crossover gift between the English and the French because of the two symbols on it. And she got me this Anglican prayer bench and it is in my study. And on that sits the Holy Scriptures and a little cushion where I can kneel and an open hymn book that I keep out there. It is my morning appointment with God. And when I travel, apart from my family, what I miss most is that prayer bench. Because you begin each day by recognizing you are just a small entity in and of yourself. Only God has made you somebody special. And so you bow before him with the words, Holy Father, Heavenly Father. It recognizes the sovereignty of God. But there's a second thing it does. It enables you to see your heart as it really is. It enables you to see your heart as it really is. Remember when Jacob is wanting to see Esau and he's sending Esau all these gifts? That's a good Eastern trait. When you're in trouble, keep sending gifts. You know, keep sending gifts. <laughs> Wise men always come gift bearing gifts with them. And so he, he's sending all these gifts, but he's terrified because Esau is bigger than he is. And he'd betrayed him and he'd stolen the blessing. And so he is saying to God at one point, I'm not going to leave you until you bless me. If you don't bless me, I'm not going to let you go. Of all the questions God could have asked him, this omniscient God who knows everything looks at Jacob and says, what's your name? <laughs> what? What's your name? One of my colleagues from India, Prakash Yasudian, who has now passed away, he was one of our, my earliest colleagues, very suddenly passed away three years ago. He one day said this to me, he said, Ravi, I've come to the conclusion I know why God asked him for his name. I said, why? He said, because when he stole the blessing, he lied about who he was. He pretended to be Esau. Now he was before an all-seeing God asking to be blessed. And God said, who are you? You got me, Lord. You got me. He said, I'm Jacob. God says, because you have admitted who you are, I will make a great nation out of you. You see, you bow before a sovereign God and you see your own unworthiness. Prayer reminds you of what the true difference should be between false humility and genuine humility. We are vessel, we are in earthly vessels bearing precious treasures. Don't ever get too cocksure about yourself. You are an earthen vessel and God has chosen to make you somebody out of this life. And so you recognize God's sovereignty, you see your own weakness, and the third thing that happens in prayer is God weaves the grand design in your life because in prayer it's not so much what you ask of him but what he does in you as a result. It's not so much what you ask of him but what he does in you. Dennis Prager, that Jewish commentator, he and I have taped, uh, teamed up a few times, fascinating man, brilliant guy. He was debating Jonathan Glover, an atheist from Oxford. And Jonathan Glover was just mocking the whole thing about the fact that we make so much about the fact that uh, Christianity has changed the world and, he, you know, all rubbish kind of thing. So Prager looked at him and he said, Professor Glover, I have a question for you. You're in my country now. If you're in a desolate part of Los Angeles, you're driving your car and your car breaks down at the dead of night and all of a sudden you hear individuals walking towards you and you see four burly guys coming towards you at the dead of night, would it make a difference to you or not if you found out they were just coming out of a Bible study? <laughs> <clears throat> Wow. 
What do you think Glover said? <laughs> you made your point. He said you made your point. See, God works his design in you when you open yourself up to his word and to his will. C.S. Lewis in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. No modern publisher would have accepted such a title. Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. And he says this at one point. He said, you know, I get mocked about prayer. People say to me in debates, you just imagine God's hearing it. All it is is auto-suggestion. You're just talking to yourself and you psych yourself up into believing somebody else has heard your prayer. And Lewis says this, they tell me, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard, that I'm dreaming. You are not there. This whole thing is absurd. Maybe they're right, Lord. Maybe they're right that I'm dreaming that the whole thing is a dream. But if it is a dream, I'm not the dreamer. You are the dreamer, and I am your dream. Maybe they're right, Lord, that only one voice is heard, but I'm not doing the dreaming. You are doing the dreaming, and I am every our dream. The grand weaver, the grand design works out. It recognizes the sovereignty of God, sees your own duplicity, makes you to be sensitive to the mind of God as he works out your passion. It wasn't it Robert Browning who wrote that little piece of poetry? How did it go? When I write a call course, something to the effect that, I, that people are actually mocking me and saying that uh, the, I think the, the, the more courses when I, I'm writing that, this, that I, the, the stick is scaring me, he says that's not real. The fact of the matter is, I am carrying the stick. When I see children ride a cock horse, I find it in my heart to embarrass them and tell them their sticks are more coarse and they really are carrying what they say carries them. Got it. <laughs> when I see children ride a cock horse, I find it in my heart to embarrass them and tell them their sticks are more coarse and they really are carrying what they say carries them. If you're a praying Christian, your faith in God will carry you. If you're not a praying Christian, you will have to carry your faith and you're going to get exhausted carrying it. The praying Christian, the praying Christian is carried by God. The praying Christian is born by God. So he gets a passion for his people, prioritized his mission by prayer. Thirdly, he pondered in proximity. He went close to the situation. I have to admit, being the first time in uh, Las Vegas to walk uh, past those casinos or something or whatever you call them and watching people especially last night on a Saturday night watching the hundreds of them and while all the liquid refreshment is flowing to get them less and less in control of their emotions and their will and I say to myself how lost can we be? How lost can we be? Some years ago, a man right here committed suicide in one of the hotels. I remember reading about it. And he left just one line in his hotel room. Out here, there are no answers. Out here, there are no answers. No, there's no answers here. Nor is there, are there answers in Washington or in any other city. The real answer is when you come on your knees before God. And as God calls you, he takes you close to where people are lost. We have shied away from the arenas. You know, the biggest criticism I have ever taken in the, my ministry is for being in places that people never wanted me to be. I say, what is the matter with you? You think I enjoy going there? I remember Chuck Colson phoning me when I went to one place for which I was taking so many hits because they were going to supposedly use me for their purposes. Chuck phoned me and he said, Ravi, go, and I want to tell you it'll be a very cold winter, so pull the shutters down. <laughs> They're going to go after you. They're going to attack you. Go and then he says to me, what do they think you are? You are an apologist. You have to be in places of counter perspectives where people disagree with you. We are called to go into such places. One of my favorite spots that I've visited over the years is in the island of Molokai in Hawaii. A man by the name of Joseph Damien 
went to Molokai, one of the most beautiful islands in the Hawaiian Islands, with the tallest sea cliffs in the world. He went because his brother was supposed to go, but his brother suddenly passed away and asked Joseph if he would go in his stead. Why did he go to Molokai? Because all of the people with leprosy in the Hawaiian Islands were sent to Molokai, and he was to go and minister to them. So he arrives in Molokai and sees this pathetic stage, works with them, loved them, embraced them, ministered to them, tried to find a cure for them. And one day as he was pouring a cup of boiling water from a kettle into the cup, it swirled out of the cup and fell on his bare foot. It took him a moment to realize he didn't feel what happened. Boiling water on a bare foot. He looked at, picked up that kettle and out of sheer shock poured some more and he didn't feel it. That morning he spoke to them. He always began his message by saying, my fellow believers, they didn't realize why he changed the line that morning by the words, my fellow lepers. When he died, the people in Molokai were burying him and the Belgian government said, no, he is one of our heroes, send him back. The Hawaiian people with leprosy said, but this is where he came to us. He was a missionary to us. We want him here. The government wouldn't let him go, wouldn't, wouldn't let him abide by that. They wanted him back. So finally they made a deal with the Belgian government. They said, can we cut off that right hand of his and bury that in Molokai? Because that's the hand that touched us. When you go to Molokai today, there's a grave marker for Joseph Damien, but all that's buried there is that right hand. You must get close. You must get close. You must reach out in your office, in your school, in your place of work to those of you who are young people, whether you're in high school or junior high or you're a university student, reach out and touch lives. Let them see the beauty of Jesus in you and your strong commitment to uphold his truth and his honor and his dignity. And the, when the years go by, they will remember you even if they mock you now. I get telephone calls from people who are in junior high with me now, some in senior high. They will call the office and say, is this the same Ravi Zacharias who went to school in Delhi? And they'll just get on the phone with me and say, what happened to you? <laughs> I've had precisely that question. One of them, who was my neighbor, flew to Toronto to spend, he works in Washington now, and he was working in the White House. He flew to Toronto to spend time with my sister and said, what happened to your brother? What happened to your brother? And she told him the story of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Get close, get close to people. So you have that passion, you prioritize by prayer, you ponder in proximity and get close. You go through the process of preparation. You must prepare. You must prepare. If you want to be a missionary somewhere totally committed, you will have to take time to study, to learn, to prepare, to work hard, to train this mind to think how best to communicate within the context in which you are going to be. You see, you never know you never know when that moment is going to come where you will have to rise beyond all of your studies to wisdom. It's both preparation and wisdom that are needed. I love to give this illustration. You may have heard me give it on the air, but it's one that happened so dramatically in my life that I will never forget it. We were meeting with one of the founders of Hamas in Ramallah, uh, the, the, the terror group, and with the former Archbishop of Canterbury, I was there with five others to dialogue with the Israeli and the Palestinian leadership, meeting with all of the best and the highest place to them. And one of the most vociferous, argumentative, and intensely passionate one was this particular sheikh, was who, uh, the founder of Hamas. He was so loud and so obnoxious wouldn't want even to listen to anything. And then as we'd had lunch with him and everything began to calm down a bit, the archbishop looked at the Abu accompanying him and said, could each one of you ask him one question? 
Since it was a private meeting, I cannot tell you what the question I asked was, but I can tell you what I said to him in response to his answer. When he gave the answer, I said, I don't like your answer, sir. I really don't like your answer. Thousands are dying because of the answer you have just given. I said, I want to tell you something, Sheikh. You may never want to see me again, but I want to tell you something. I said, 5,000 years ago, on a mountain not far from her here, a man you respect and I respect by the name of Abraham took his son up that mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. Do you remember that story? He said, yes. I said, please, let's not debate right now which son it was. But we just know that he took his son up that mountain. And as the ax is about to come down from Abraham to his son, God stops that arm. He said, that's right. I said, what did God say? He was silent. I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, very close to where you and I are sitting, Sheikh, 2,000 years ago, God kept that promise. He took his own son up a hill, and this time the ax did not stop. He just kept staring at me. The room was filled with tobacco smoke. And then I said to him, Sheikh, until you and I receive the son God has provided for us, we will be offering our own sons on the battlefields of this world for position and power and land and prestige. He just stared at me and there was silence. The Archbishop said, I think it's time to go now. <laughs> and we were walking away and the Archbishop put his arm around me and he said, Ravi, that was of God. I said, I sure hope so. So we went down the stairs, and the Archbishop was the guest of honor, and the Sheikh was ushering him. We were walking to our own vehicle, and I heard running feet behind me. And as I turned around, it was Sheikh, the Sheikh, and he twirled me around. And he grabbed me by the shoulder. He's a strong guy. He spent many years in prison and all that. And he looked at me, and he said, Mr. Zacharias. And he patted me on both sides of the face, and he kissed me. He said, you're a good man. You're a good man. I hope someday I will see you again. And as I was driving, my car traveling associate was with me there, and I was in a daze. I said, Lord, where did that come from? How did I even think of sharing that thought with him with such audacity, but such realism for him? You know, Paul was put away for three years to be prepared. We don't know what all was happening in the life of our Lord till the moment of his baptism came. We know Moses was there on the backside of the desert for four decades. God always prepares his instrument. You have to be ready to be praying the price. If God is calling you into some real form of ministry, pay the price of study. Pay the price of discipline. As I said to an audience last night, you cannot set a tepid Christianity beside a scorching paganism. You've got to be armed in truth. You've got to be ready. And then I say this to you quickly, avoid the paralysis of pessimism. Avoid the paralysis of pessimism. People will tell you it's hopeless. It's going, never going to change. It's never going to make a difference. I'll tell you, I have seen lives change that I never ever dreamed would ever be changed. I've got a colleague here, if he gave his testimony to you, you'd be stunned at the degree of change that came in his life. I was writing an email just this morning to my colleague Michael Ramsden because he just left Manila in the Philippines. I'll give you this illustration and then close with my final thought, which I promise you'll be brief. Some years ago, Three, four years ago, I think, no, I lose, lose context. The, my, my wife says, whenever Ravi says recently, it means because he doesn't remember when it happened. <laughs> so I was in Manila. I'd just spoken three times that day, and a businessman had said he was going to take me out for dinner. And my assistant said, you know he has spoken three times. So when you're saying dinner, it, you mean dinner, right? Not a Q&A session or anything like that because there's no free lunch, you know. So he said, no, I'm taking him out for dinner. So we arrived, so I'm sitting in the car, 
and we are driving. And I text the man, my colleague sitting next to me, I said, I have a terrible feeling this is a speaking engagement. <laughs> we arrive in this beautiful hotel and there's 45 businessmen sitting around tables. And he says to them, today's my birthday and I've invited you and my gift to you is to bring my friend to speak to you. I said, I don't believe this. I, re I, I wanted to cry. I really wanted to cry. So, um, and so they're all feasting, enjoying this. And I'm speaking on man's search for meaning. <laughs> and then at the end, he said, since we've already punished him enough, let's punish him a little more. Do you have any questions? <laughs> and this tall, handsome guy stands up and he puts out his arms like that wide wingspan. And he says to me, meaning, I don't have meaning. I've tried to take my life a couple of times. I don't know what you're talking about, meaning. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you're such a handsome guy. You look like you're made for the movies. I didn't know he was a film actor. <laughs> I said, you look like you're made for the movies. I said, you're shedding tears and it's running down your face. Everybody in the room knew who he was. I said, I'd rather talk to you privately. Would you be willing to talk to me? He said, yes, I will. So after it's over, they're all standing in the corner watching this conversation. He says, Ravi, I'm a medical doctor and I'm a film actor. I'm known all over this country, but I messed up my life. And he told me of the sordid reality of how he was living in private, so sensually erotic and erratic that he was making a mess of his life till some of his friends had taken some of the videos that he had made of himself in these horrible things and put them on YouTube. They called him up before parliament because he was a medical doctor. They poured water over his head and he moved from being the most adored man in the Philippines to being the most hated man in the Philippines. We had the privilege of seeing him come to Jesus Christ. The press interviewed me when I came back sometime later, one year after that moment, and they said, we want to talk to you about Hayden. What's happened to him? His testimony is all over the land and the impact he's made. And today, Michael Ramsden, who has just left Manila, my colleague, was telling me of the impact of Hayden Co. in that country. And I said, Michael, who would have ever known when you're preaching at a place where you don't even want to be and you didn't know you were going to be and God takes a man like that and is having a huge impact all over the country with his testimony. Don't be pessimistic. He can take the most painful moments of your life and find out that he used it for the greatest glory. His story, my friends would tell you. <laughs> Avoid the paralysis of pessimism. I was at one university with a leading atheist, got a whole group of students to mock my coming. At the end of that weekend, he started attending a Bible study. <laughs> fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Lastly, he brought peace for his people. If you believe the gospel is the truth and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, prioritize your mission by prayer. Get, get close. Take the preparation. Avoid the paralysis of pessimism. You will bring peace to many a person and peace into many a situation. I urge you to take your missionary call seriously. God has called every one of us to be a missionary. You may not realize it. It could change history. John Wesley was five or seven years old when he was caught in a burning house. His parents thought they had brought him down. They didn't. They, brought, they had so many children, they didn't know who all they brought down. And John was, I think, five or seven at the window. The house was burning. And the neighbor comes over, 
And they said, you have a ladder? He says, no, but the house is now engulfed. So the neighbor said to the man next to him, stand on my shoulder. They formed a human ladder and took John out of that window. That's why his biography is called A Brand Plucked Out of the Burning. Not one of them knew that one day they would be standing on his shoulders. As he changed the course of history, don't underestimate what God can do through you. And I want to leave you with this prayer as a closing petition before God. Charles Wesley wrote this. Just hear it, and then I will pray. He said this, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gifts in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat till death thy endless mercy seal and make my sacrifice complete. To work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gifts in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat till death thy endless mercy seal and make my sacrifice complete. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, you have used people like engineers, like tent makers, like tax collectors. You have used shepherds, fishermen. You've used a young carpenter. It is amazing across this landscape of history how you have accomplished your purpose. This is our moment, Lord. We need you. A city with no moral walls needs you. A world without boundaries needs you. We need you, Lord, more than ever. I pray for our leaders. We are a nation in turmoil. So much a hate that we see is troubling us, Lord. We cannot see two feet ahead of us what's going to happen in a new day. We live with uncertainty, except, except you break through and we are confident you will attain your perfect will. Out of this audience, please find men and women who will serve you and say, here am I, Lord. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Here's what I'm going to do. If God has spoken to you during these two days, through the messages, through the music, and tonight you're wanting to say, Ravi, I want on the inside to say to my Lord, take me. I will be a cause. I will be a person for your cause wherever you place me, and I will be a light in a dark world. Or maybe you don't even know him, and you want to find him tonight. But if you do know him, say, I want to be an instrument of his peace and his message. If that's your response, why don't you just stand to your feet? I would like to pray for you in closing. Just rise to your feet. So many of you, don't do it if you don't mean it. Just do it. Do it with the voice of God in your heart and stand. Let me pray for you. Father, we've got this whole audience standing at its feet. How wonderful it would be if everyone here is really reaching out to you and saying, use me. 
Thank you for my dear sister in Christ, for Kay Arthur. How many trails she has blazed. I think of Jeremy and his music, along with his precious wife, Adrian, and others, for Brian, and all who have contributed to the music tonight so beautifully rendered. I thank you for Derek and his team here in a city that needs so much of light that they have taken a stand for you with the name of a very hill because of which history was changed. I pray your benediction upon the leadership here and the people. May their best days be ahead. Expand their walls but let the walls of their moral reasoning and their deep convictions ever be held firmly rooted in the foundation of your truth. Thank you for giving me the privilege of speaking 